Hello and welcome. Let's take a look at our top story. Now, we have been telling you about the ongoing Russia-US rivalry in Africa. This rivalry is about increasing influence in the continent. In recent times, Russia has been able to gain some edge. It has made significant inroads in the continent. Now, Russia has challenged Western presence through different covert and overt strategies. While Moscow is diminishing Western military presence in Africa, it is parallelly running other campaigns that are targeting Western diplomatic, economic and cultural influence. And public health care is now on Russian President Vladimir Putin's list. As per reports, U.S.-funded anti-malaria programs are Russia's latest target in Africa. Malaria is one of the gravest health problems in Africa. For years, it has been the leading cause of deaths and illnesses in the continent. U.S.-funded programs are helping scientists to solve the malaria problem. But pro-Russian activists and influencers have been trying to convince people that these scientists are not in Africa to end the malaria crisis, but rather to further increase it. Now, one effort to fight malaria in Africa is called the Target Malaria. It is a non-profit backed by Western institutions. They operate in countries like Burkina Faso, Ghana and Uganda. In Burkina Faso, the group is working to create a species of mosquito that will not transmit malaria. But pro-Russian activists have reportedly said the group is behind the rising cases of the deadly disease. Though their claims are not backed by any scientific evidence, but nevertheless, the word has spread that the Western scientists are conspirators. But this is not an isolated incident. Russian propaganda on health care is part of its wider disinformation campaign in Africa. As per the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, so Russia continues to be the primary purveyor of disinformation in Africa, sponsoring 80 documented campaigns and targeting more than 22 countries. The organization blames that such disinformation campaigns have a destabilizing and anti-democratic consequences. Now, these campaigns have reached millions of users. So how is Russia running its ideological warfare in Africa? Social media plays a huge role. Africa is home to an estimated 600 million internet users, including 400 million who are active on social media. So that's an easy and influential audience for Russia. Russia reportedly hires African journalists, bloggers and members of local public to amplify its message and image. And recently, it also launched a news outlet called the African Initiative, which has been successful in promoting Russian culture in the continent. Russia's state-owned media RT channel has also expanded its network in Africa. It has started various ventures with African media that uh, spread pro-Russian and anti-Western propaganda. The efforts have been particularly focused on the three military-run countries of Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso. These military-run neighbors have turned their backs on Western partners and have forged closer ties with Russia. The growing Russian influence is visible in the Sahel countries. Videos have shown teenage footballers listening to the Russian national anthem before a match in Burkina Faso. Russian President Vladimir Putin's portrait has become far too common a sight in Western Africa. And now that healthcare has also reportedly become a part of Russia's disinformation campaign, how will it impact the continent, which is reeling from multiple health-related disasters? The United States has tried to warn people about this campaign. But will it be successful? Or will Russia manage to gain an edge in Africa? To discuss this further, we have with us Patrick Bond, Distinguished Professor at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you for being with us. Oh, good to be with you and the viewers, Alison. Thanks. Now, how does Russia's interference with the US-funded anti-malaria programs affect the broader geopolitical competition between Russia and the US on the African continent? 
Well, it is very important. The weaponization of public health has been uh, noted. You, you would sort of say conspiracy theories around uh, health uh, became uh, notorious during the COVID period when uh, there were all sorts of questions as to how uh, this disease was spreading and whether the, uh, the vaccines and other treatments were effective and how especially the West had locked up through intellectual property, although Russia also with its Sputnik uh, with its vaccine, also had an interest in, let's say, intellectual property. Uh, Russia did join India along with South Africa, Kenya in fighting against the uh, intellectual property, uh, that is to call for a waiver, uh, but not very hard. And um, the US also uh, withdrew its uh, sort of, let's say, uh, dogmatic uh, intellectual property uh, on that. And so we've seen public health become a site for, uh, let's say, struggle over millions of lives. In South Africa alone, we had 300,000 deaths due to COVID, and many, many could have been prevented had it not been for Boris Johnson in the UK and Angela Merkel in Germany sticking to intellectual property restrictions, which meant we couldn't get generic uh, vaccines and treatments. So you can see public health. We would even take it back to AIDS, where uh, the US had opposed getting AIDS medicines off of intellectual property in the World Trade Organization, with Africa having about 40 million people living with HIV. Uh, that meant the life expectancy went way down. And it was a struggle to get rid of some of the, let me say, corporate power over uh, health care. And that's why it's so, uh, I say, mm. re refreshing that the US did come around. And it has a, has a very good program for AIDS medicines called PEPFAR and the anti-malaria work, where, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates supporting it there have a very mixed record in the health field. But it is one of those sites, regrettably, after the Russians lost um, uh, uh, Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group, uh, in that plane crash 14 months ago, um, and then reassembled the Africa Corps and really is digging in and making sure that at least in some of the countries that are uh, loyal to Putin, that they are going to have uh, what appears to me misinformation about uh, U.S. malaria, uh, um, anti-malaria support. Mm. Mm. And what are the potential short and long-term public health impacts on malaria prevention efforts in African countries where these programs are disrupted? Yeah, if they're really being disrupted by um, uh, ill-informed uh, malevolent influencers, which happens all the time, the Russians are just as notorious as uh, as many in the United States who who also play uh, on social media with misinformation. So these are you know two countries, and in fact, even the Africa Center for Strategic Studies is located in the Pentagon. We never really know whether the Pentagon or the New York Times, which broke this story, are really telling the truth. They have uh, you know mixed records. So I would say that if you uh, take malaria as a major problem, 600,000 deaths a year. Um, and what the studies have shown uh, since the year 2000 is that it's getting worse in some areas where there's higher humidity, higher rainfall, therefore more puddles and places for the mosquitoes to breed. And um, it's in that sense that I think a bigger problem, which is indeed the uh, a climate catastrophe, which is causing this humidity and causing extreme weather. And there, the US is number two emitter of greenhouse gases, Russia number four. And I think these are where, let me call it a climate debt is owed by, especially the United States, the number one historic emitter. So I hope they don't stop uh, funding malaria because of this sort of misinformation. It's one of the things that I think Washington owes to the continent of Africa to try to help eradicate uh, this, this awful disease of malaria. And Professor, how are the African governments and regional bodies responding to Russia's actions? And what measures are being taken to ensure that critical health programs are protected? Well, you know, the African Union is the crucial uh, body because it does have a strong public health um, component. And indeed, the head of the World Health Organization is from Ethiopia. So there's a lot of concern that the AU get more priority and it is joining as of uh, last September in the Delhi meeting of the G20. It will be uh, meeting uh, the AU as a, as a body as part of the G20 now uh, in Rio and then South Africa hosts the G20 next year. And that's usually a place where the sorts of pledges can be made from uh, the West and the BRICS uh, countries to working together, the 
let me call them imperial and sub-imperial alliance, they do recognize in those settings that they have to give African Union uh, officials much more attention than in the past. And likewise, two new African states will probably join the United Nations Security Council, although without veto uh, powers. That is something the US uh, doesn't want to see, uh, let's say, um, diluted, and neither does Russia nor China. Now, those are the kind of questions of the institutional power of representatives from the continent. Can they speak out and not be trampled by these two big elephants, the US and Russia, as both um, try to make both geopolitical and also, let's not uh, underestimate, raw material extraction agendas uh, with the new economies requiring yeah. some of the cobalt. Uh, those are the sorts of things we'll continue to watch and the battleground now includes public health. It's, it's a shame. Hmm. Professor, thank you very much for being with us on the show. As always, great to, to have you and uh, thanks for your valued insights. Thank you. First Post decodes the US election explains how America chooses its president. Your primer on the race to the White House. Everything you need to know about how America votes and its global implications. U.S. Election Explained. Every Monday and Thursday only on First Post.